RJ is uh, the founder, chief executive officer of Intrexon Corporation. He's an attorney by training. He entered the biomedical field in 1983, co-founding General Injectables and Vaccines. I hear injectables and I get queasy in this uh, right away. But uh, he's been at the forefront in uh, biotechs uh, uh, as an investor, an innovator, and an executive. And he's brought together a number of successful drugs to market. And uh, lately, um, he has had the power, using the power of big data to develop other pharma, I, if I can say this, pharmacogenomics, um, which will can alter the future of agriculture. Please welcome R.J. Kirk. Thank you. Have oh, you tried the Arctic this apple? Is, this is an Arctic apple? Yes, sir. Oh, thank yes, you. Sir. Thank you, R.J. Thank you, Ambassador. So uh, I was just asked why I come here um, being a few moments ago. And so I just want to, I thought since I was paying a compliment to you to another, I would pay the compliment directly to you, uh, which is this is actually my favorite, it's become my favorite event of the year. And the reason it is, is because, the reason it is that is because I've been involved in a few other industries, as uh, the ambassador indicated, uh, really began in therapeutics and um, I've had, a, had some luck there. But um, when, my, when I was first invited to come to the World Food Prize, I will tell you, I was astonished to see that an industry could be this mutually supportive. Uh, it's essentially united in, uh, in its overall goals. Uh, which I actually don't see almost in any other line of human endeavor. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> it, uh, it, it's collaborative. Uh, we all know and agree on the challenges and the objectives that, uh, that, that, are, that lie before us. Uh, it may differ somewhat in the details of how they're achieved, but uh, it, it really creates a very great dialogue. And so uh, I, I just love being here. Um, it's a great community. So, and we're happy to be a part of it. So I, uh, as the ambassador indicated, I lead a company called Intrexon. It's a publicly listed company, so I have to show you these forward-looking statements to point out that some of what I say may contain uncertainties and risks. I hope they do. Uh, otherwise, how, how much fun could they be? But, uh, so, the relevance that I think my company has uh, at the World Food Prize and in this community has to do with the matter that I raised before. We have to produce, in the, in the area of food, 50, you all know this better than I do, at least 50% more food by 2046, 100% more food protein. And we really need to do that on no more, probably fewer acres than are employed today. Uh, we need to do that uh, using no more and probably less water than we do today. Uh, and we truly need a better, uh, a better environmental footprint uh, than is the case today. That's actually doable, but it's not doable by just doing more of what we've done in the past. It, it is going to require adoption of technology. It's going to require a lot of new technology, and that's where we come in. So uh, my company is, we think, the foremost company in the field of what's called synthetic biology, which basically means that we program and reprogram living organisms to various purposes. And as you can see from this, we're pretty diverse. We're in health. We'll have some news out within the next few weeks <laughs> uh, about some of the things we're doing in cancer uh, and some other, uh, some other therapeutic areas. Uh, we're in energy. We've, we have a, we've engineered a, a microbe, a bacterium, that eats natural gas. Uh, the wild-type organism does this, but doesn't do anything of you of, you know, useful uh, with it. Uh, we've engineered these organisms to upgrade natural gas into things like, oh, isobutanol, which is to all intents and purposes gasoline, uh, one through butadiene, which is synthetic rubber, uh, and to do so at great carbon efficiency. So we're really excited about that program. And we've been focused on that. Meanwhile, we've been building our presence in food because we think uh, uh, there's just so much to be done. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about food today or what we're doing in food. So first, let's talk about animals. Some of you may know about this. Uh, we uh, own the majority of, uh, of a company called Aqua Bounty, 
uh, which has FDA approval and Health Canada approval on the world's first genetically engineered food animal. It's called the Aqua Advantage Salmon. Its singular characteristic is that it achieves market weight in one half the time and on 30% less food. So we've been approved in the United States for three years. Now, by the way, Canadian diners do enjoy this product every day today. But what really excites me about it is we think this is a superior product. 95% of the salmon that's consumed in the United States is imported. You talk about a food security issue, and this is true large, uh, really everywhere in the world but Norway and Chile. Um, they grow them in sea cages. So let's just think about it. So if you corral a bunch of fish in a cage in the ocean and pour food on top, that attracts all the indigenous marine life. They bring every pathogen they possess to your valuable fish. The mortality rates in these sea cages are typically 50%. Our scientists to create the library of sea lice that they wanted to look at to see if we could do anything about the sea lice problem had to go no further than the supermarket. We think probably every salmon that is placed on your plate uh, has sea lice. Um, so our idea is to spend part of this production advantage we have with this fish by producing it in places like, oh, let's say Des Moines for the local market. So they could be antibiotic-free, they could be C-pathogen-free, they could be vaccine-free, and cost no more than the stuff that comes from Norway or Chile. And by the way, since they would be so much fresher and didn't have the antibiotics and so forth, they'll taste better. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, it's GMO. Well, so let me tell you the, the, the result of that. It took the FDA 20 years of struggle to approve this. And you can imagine the political resistance they had. Um, people ask, well, you know, are you sure you know every possible risk that could pertain, you know, that could, could result from this fish? I say, we actually don't, but I can tell you one thing for sure. This is the single most studied, from a scientific point of view, it's the single most studied food animal in the history of the world. So if this fish scares you, you really should be scared of cows. <laughs> Speaking of cows, so... I was over, I was in uh, Sioux Center, Iowa a couple, uh, couple days ago. This is an absolute, uh, I, I hope the folks in Iowa, I, I dined last night with some of the uh, economic development people, I know they are proud of it, but I, I don't know how widely this, this pride is shared. Our operation in uh, Sioux Center, which is called Transova, uh, literally sets the world standard and it actually recalibrates the world standard because they are, they're the ones who are driving it. Uh, for genetic gain, for genetic improvement of dairy cows. In terms of, once again, in terms of food uh, security and food efficiency, this is a very big deal. Um, these, the heifers, these Holstein heifers, well, let me just mention, one of my screensavers I really love a lot, has one of our Holstein heifers uh, suckling uh, an Angola. This is in a pasture in Uganda. Uh, you can see, it's a beautiful, beautiful photo. You can see the, uh, Lake Victoria in the background, beautiful green pasture, and one of those you know, brown cows with the horns that stick straight up uh, is, the, is the birth mother to a beautiful Holstein Friesian calf. Now, we know her genetics, so I can tell you this. The milk output of the daughter will be five times that of the mother. And when you can introduce that into, econ you know, into places in the world like India, by the way, in India, uh, the genetic gain we, ex we anticipate there is 6-6-X. Six, six uh, the entire dairy industry in India is, is micro-lended, financed by the government. Uh, the cows are almost entirely owned by women, one to two cows per family. If you can improve the milk output of those cows by 6-X, you have noticeably moved the dial uh, economically and nutritionally for about 350 million people. So we're excited about this and uh, like I said, I, uh, I think Iowa should be very proud of this operation. These people literally drive uh, the bulk of the genetic improvement of dairy cattle worldwide. So, I met Dr. Kutsus, where are you? Please stand up. Are you? There she is. So she heads an operation called EnviroFlight. <clears throat> we are joint venture partners in. I love this business. So what you see here are chickens enjoying black soldier fly larvae, recently approved by FDA. 
uh, as a poultry supplement. You know, some of us forget that fish and birds are insectivores, and by the way, a lot of humans are too. Um, so when it comes to feeding the world, right, you, you really need to take a hard look at insect larvae because they're extremely efficient. They eat biomass that almost nothing else will eat. Uh, they do so, uh, they're, they're actually, despite the fact that, you know, I, mean, I don't know how you think about maggots, but, <laughs> but the truth is they're more pristine than almost any food source that you're going to come across, much more, much more so, especially the way uh, uh, Dr. Kutzos and her operation uh, operate. So, uh, so we're very excited about this. We think this has a very bright future, certainly as an animal feed now. Uh, we will uh, cut the ribbon on, uh, on a plant in uh, Maysville, Ohio next month. It will be the largest uh, animal feed uh, source of, uh, of, of insect uh, larvae uh, in the country, and we have big plans for expanding this business. But we also think this is going to be human nutrition going forward. In plants, well, I just handed the ambassador an Arctic apple, and we have some on the table that have just been sliced. Uh, or that were sliced this morning, sometime earlier this morning, you won't be able to tell, the dip, tell when they were sliced because they don't brown. So this is both a food security and a food improvement issue. So <clears throat> knocking around in the outer edge of the genome, so to speak, of, of the apple and almost every fruit is a little enzyme system called polyphenol oxidase. Uh, we sometimes forget, we are so anthropocentric, we actually do buy the story of the Garden of Eden, you know what I mean, which is not true. The biosphere is actually hostile to us, and if we hadn't developed these neofrontal cortices, we would be extinct. Uh, all the other hominids, our, our hominid brothers all did die and uh, go extinct. That's what kind of Garden of Eden we in inherited. So. Uh, so, but since we are so anthropocentric, we think that fruit was actually created for our pleasure. It wasn't. It's fertilizer for the seeds. This is conserved in nature, right? Uh, to be, so that the seeds will find their most rapid path to germination and, have a, and produce another healthy plant. So as part of that, this polyphenol oxidase system in, just basically turns on in response to shear force, cutting, biting, percussion, you know, like falling from a tree, okay? And then we talk about fruit bruising. That's the visual result of this enzyme system. So it turns, it's brown. We know it's not a bruise though because we know they don't have blood. It's not a hematoma. Uh, so what's going on? Well, this polyphenol oxidase breaks down the cell wall which then invites in bacteria uh, which accelerates the decomposition, which is very much in nature's interest so that those seeds uh, can find their most rapid path to germination. My point is, this is clearly at odds with our use of fruit. The result of apple browning, and let's just take the food security issue, results in about 50% loss of this entire crop, 5-0, okay? Uh, the other thing is, it actually doesn't taste as good as ours. Uh, we'll say more about this in the future. We want, some, uh, we want some consumer testing to back this up, but I will just say, based on the science, we believe, and by, uh, by the way, my personal experience and those of us who've actually tasted the apple, I'll be very interested in the ambassador's view. Uh, we think this apple actually tastes better as well. So you'll be able to slice it, put it in a bag, t have it at lunch later in the day without refrigeration, and it tastes like it just came off of the tree no preservatives or chemicals necessary. So, huge improvement. And by the way, the apple industry in the United States has been in decline for 17 years. It's pretty easy to understand why. Given, as, as Neil Carter, who created this apple, uh, is fond of saying, a whole apple is simply just more of a commitment that a modern consumer wants to make. <laughs> it's, you know, let, let's just date for a while. You know. <laughs> uh, but in reality, I mean, how many unit of use packages do you see that are like <laughs> that, are like that size, right? Um, so we would obviously prefer just to have the slices and, and other uses of the apple available to us. Um, now, this is a really big thing, and, uh, and I've had a couple of meetings uh, uh, here at this conference with people who share our interest in this, in this subject. Our scientists in Oxford, England, there are about 100 there. Um, possess the world's leading in engineered insect platform. Uh, this technology also is about 20 years old. They've been working it constantly for 20 years, and what they have produced is absolutely marvelous. 
uh, we are thrilled to uh, have this as part of Intrexon because I think to all intents and purposes, to a great extent, let's say, uh, the age of the chemical pesticide is over. And it's over because we can't put that genie back in the bottle. If it's one thing we've learned is that we can't, we can't control a chemical once we release it. Now, I have nothing against chemicals. We use them every day, and, uh, and, we, and, and a lot of times it's worth, the, it's worth the risk and it's worth the downside to use them. So I'm not a chemophobe. Um, but the point is, as we move forward to protect from crop loss, what if we could simply target the insect species that is doing the damage and simply reduce its population with absolutely zero other impact to the environment and be able to guarantee that the intervention is over when we stop? That's where we are. That's exactly where we are. I'm happy to take anybody through the science and our field, uh, our field data. What this is a picture of is a corn, corn plant that's been uh, being decimated by fall armyworm. You know, we always talk about invasive species coming to North America from, from elsewhere. Well, this is an invasive species that's gone from North America to Africa and is now decimating uh, grain crops uh, in Africa to just it's a huge, I mean, about 50% loss uh, in much of the continent. Um, so we're, we're really pleased about this. We have a, well, we announced a, our second partnership with the Gates Foundation in the uh, Anopheles clade of mosquitoes so, so we can combat malaria using this same, uh, what we just announced this yesterday, uh, using this same technology. So this is, I think this is really the future. We generally, when I'm talking with the egg bio guys here, and I say precision bio, we all, that's the term of art we use, Mr. Ambassador, <laughs> precision biologics. Uh, and precision biologics are preferred over prior uses because, because we're, they are precise, so we know exactly what we did. And if you have a concern about that, then we can test. We can test for that concern because we know the tiny thing that we did. It's, it's much more precise than, say, breeding. Um, we have a technology that allows us to go from a few plant cells to an, an incredible number of um, genetically identical plants bypassing the seed or any need for germination. Um, so this again improves uh, plant efficiency and it stabilizes genetics. A lot of plants are highly variable. They, we, you know, the, the saying in agronomy is they don't grow true from seed. Um, well, we're just bypassing that part. Uh, thus the name Botticelli. Um, so you'll see, you'll see more about this going forward. And then <laughs> we think this is really cool technology. So a lot of crops, I mean, the majority of the crops that are, that are grown within a stone's throw of here are, um, are engineered. <laughs> and they're engineered to have traits. So we had a slightly different idea. What if we could turn traits on and off? In other words, if you take a look at a water use efficient, that WUE, -W they call it at Monsanto and, uh, and, and uh, Corteva and so forth. Um, but if you produce a, a, a water use efficient plant and in a wet year, it's going to underperform. So you'll be sorry you did that, right? But what if we could just turn on the trait when you need it, whether it's a fungicide or a pesticide, simply with a spray, right? A spray of something that we know is completely harmless to humans. So we've done that. And what you see here is a field of uh, alfalfa that is flowering because we told it to and the identical plant to the left that's not flowering because we didn't tell it to. And in reality, why would you ever want your, your, your production alfalfa to go to seed anyway? The protein drops and it pretty soon is useless. So I think I have 18, 17, 16 seconds left. So <laughs> let me wrap by saying uh, we're going to have a lot more to say about uh, our presence in food. I think this is... Uh, uh, going to be an increasing uh, focus of our company. We're very excited to be part of the community. Uh, we're uh, absolutely uh, thrilled uh, to be able to, or at least to hope to be able to, uh, make significant contributions to the, the beautiful objectives of this community. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, RJ. Thank you so much. I love when RJ comes. He's got more ideas out there about things that I don't have any way of understanding how they happen, but I know how incredibly important they are. And uh, I, I hope some of these are going to be soon, sooner rather than later, uh, 
you know, nominated for the World Food Prize. It's the kind of thing we're, we're looking for.